Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel Wild Like a Flower Gardening. My name is Sarah and in this video I'm going to be covering some of the common invasive species that you may have lurking in your backyards, garden spaces, or if you have large scale property you may have it out in your woods or your fields. I am really excited to finally be able to take you guys outside with me. The weather is beautiful, I put some sunscreen on, I've got my trusty bucket hat, so let's get right into it shall we? So before I get crazy, I want to just talk about some really, really basic things that you should have on you when you're outside working with invasive species. First, you should really have a pair of leather gloves. All right, so a lot of these invasive species, they may be irritating to your skin or they may have thorns. One of the most common species is multiflor rose, it has some really painful thorns. I don't think I'm gonna find any barberry out here today, but barberry also has thorns. So it's really important when you're outside, you wanna have some leather gloves with you. And I also brought my snips. Now you may have some that you use in your garden, but snips are going to be important if you're going to be taking any cuttings, um, so that way you can compare it to other plants, so that way you can verify that you have the correct plant species or not. Um, when you're also working with honeysuckle and you're trying to figure out if it's honeysuckle or privet, it's important to take a cutting and take a look at that cross section of the pith on the inside. So I'm going to grab the camera, I'm going to get my gloves on, and the first species we're going to talk about is multiflora rose. Okay, so first on the menu is multiflora rose. Some of the most obvious identifying characteristics are these really terrifying looking thorns. Um, they've been considered to look kind of like cat claws because they have a curve to them. And if you've ever walked through multiflora rose, you know that those thorns that have that curve, they really grab you and they do not let go. Now you can also see here that it has a greenish purplish stem. That's pretty common. Uh, you can find them very bright green and sometimes you can find them much more red. Right here are some stems that are quite purpley, but we've also got some stems that are very green. So it really just depends. Um, there are some other plants that have purple stems, so it is important to know the difference. Right now, this one is not leafing out as much as some of the rows closer to my house. Um, this is probably just maybe a few days behind the rows that's closer to where I live. Here is a neat little discovery on this multiflora rose. I think this is some sort of moth cocoon hanging out. Um, so that's really awesome. But other than this, multiflora rose doesn't really benefit wildlife. It has a tendency to take over and crowd out the native vegetation that is much more useful to wildlife. I think rabbits use it as, you know, thicket cover. But other than that, multiflora rose is really just a pain in the butt. Now, if left to its own devices, multiflora rose can get really, really big and scary. This one in particular, I'm only, what, 5'5", five, five, and this, can you see all the way up at the top? I mean, this is so tall, and this is probably just the growth from last year. And what it'll do is if there's anything closer, it's going to keep climbing. This will eventually come down, but it likes to wrap up into other trees and choke them out. And if left to its own devices, these stems, they can get a couple inches in diameter and become just massive, massive, massive shrubs that are really difficult to kill. Um, you'll have to take a handsaw or a weed blade to them in order to cut through them because, you know, my little snips, I can snip this stuff right now, um, but once it gets thicker, I'm going to not be able to use those and I'll need bigger equipment. Now, I'm not going to cut this right now because I don't want to disturb this moth um, that is clearly using this stem. Um, I think leaving the multiflora rose is much more beneficial at this exact second. Um, but this is definitely something, since it's coming right over top of the trail, that you would want to cut back um, and remove because it's going to grab somebody's noggins one of these days. You can see here that these leaves are almost about to pop out. Um, I'm surprised they haven't already, but they're probably just a few days away from really leafing out. Um, now, multiflora rose, it spreads by uh, berries or rose hips, if you will, and those are commonly eaten by songbirds. And if you know anything about songbirds, they really like to hang out in thickets and fence rows, and they eat and then they poop, just like we all do. And so when they poop, they often drop seeds from many plants that they ate the berries for, or if they're seed eaters, they'll just drop those seeds. Um, but so 
when they poop and they leave these seeds behind, you know, they're planting multiflora rows. And this is a common way that many other invasive species are traveling because a lot of the other invasive species that are very successful, they often reproduce through producing a berry. And songbirds, you know, are a very common species everywhere you go. And so you end up with these songbirds that are unfortunately carrying and promoting these invasive species. Now there are quite a few different species that you may get confused with multiflora rose and since this one's sitting right here we're going to talk about it. Um, this one also doesn't look very friendly but this is a native species. This is greenbrier and you can tell the difference between it and multiflora rose is it has these very, still intimidating, but very straight thorns. Now they're not fun to walk through but unless it's in the way um, of you know trails or really being problematic it's important to leave greenbrier. Greenbrier also has berries, which are very useful to wildlife, and if you can get more greenbrier than multiflora rose, it's much better for wildlife to eat those berries and spread greenbrier than it is for them to be spreading the multiflora rose. Now something else that you'll see if you look closely to the stem here is that this has an angled stem. Now I've got my gloves on, so let's see here. If you look closer, so multiflora rose has that rounded stem. Greenbrier has... Um, you know, edges to it, like a square stem, if you will. So you're looking at straight thorns and a square stem as compared to a round stem and curved cat claw thorns. They're both rather green stems, so that's where, you know, you may get greenbrier and multiflora rose confused, but if it's got this angled square stem and it's got those straight thorns, then you're probably looking at greenbrier and you want to leave it alone unless it's sitting in the middle of a trail and it's going to cut you up as you walk through. So after walking down the trail just a little bit, I did find some multiflora rose that is beginning to leaf out. You can see the beginning of these compound leaves. Um, they will get a lot bigger than this um, because, you know, they got a lot of photosynthesizing to do. But you can see here that compared to everything else, nothing else is really green yet. And the multiflora rose is beginning to leaf out much sooner than the rest of the native vegetation. I'm not going to lie, trying to be out here filming with dogs is not my favorite. But, you know, as a dog mom, you got to kill multiple birds with, you know, one or two stones but I mean this is incredible like spring is here and the location that I'm at I'm really excited um, as the sun goes down I'll be watching some woodcocks so I'm gonna try to get some footage of that so I will probably loop that in at the end of the video if you're interested in hearing some cool woodcocks go ahead and watch all the way to the end or skip to the end if you know you only like the birds but is that just insane So perks of being out of golden hour is amazing lighting, um, but it is so bright. Um, something else I wanted to point out that's really important, you should probably bring with you when you're out here, is some flagging tape. I did not coordinate it with my outfit, um, but this is one of my favorite colors. Um, you want to probably be tagging a lot of the invasive species that you see because right now they're leaving out a lot sooner than a lot of the other vegetation. So it's a great time to see them first um, before there's a lot of green vegetation making it a lot harder um, to see and um, pick out the species that you don't want. So go ahead and pick up some, you know, cheap flagging tape and, you know, just go ahead and tag things as you see them. That way it's a lot easier to go back um, because right now is not the best time to be removing or cutting. You want to be doing a lot of your removal in the fall, to be honest. Um, if you were to cut multiflora rose right now, all it's going to do is re-sprout at the roots. Same with honeysuckle. So you want to focus your um, efforts towards the end of the, you know, growing season. Can I help you, ma'am? Um, and so like by the end of the growing season, you're going to have a lot more greenery around you. So if you go ahead and tag it now, it's going to make it a lot easier when you come back and look for it later. Um, you can also use things um, like GPS units to drop the location. Um, if you find a big thicket of an invasive species, you can use apps like Avenza if you can download a map for your property. And you can also just use Google Maps or Google Earth. But either way, you want to be making sure that you're tracking where these um, invasive species are, especially if you end up with a really big patch. You are absolutely obsessed with veg. It's a problem and we really need to do an intervention. All right, I was starting to get a little nervous that I wasn't going to find any honeysuckle out here, which I thought would be um, 
slim chances of not having any honeysuckle out here since it's everywhere. Um, so I'd like to say that I'm excited that I found it, but you know, obviously it's not great that it's here. Um, but this is honeysuckle. This is the vine, um, Japanese honeysuckle. And what you're looking at right here um, are the leaves from last year. So honeysuckle will keep its leaves all winter long and photosynthesize the whole time. Um, it has opposite leafing, which means that there's one leaf on this side and another leaf on this side. And as you can see right here, these are gonna be the leaves for this coming growing season that will eventually replace these bad boys right here. So like I had said earlier, a good way to tell the difference between honeysuckle and privet is if you cut it. Got my handy dandy snips, snip, snip. So we're gonna go ahead and cut that. And if you look at the stem, let's see if I can get this to focus on it. It's very small. You can see that it's got a hollow center. Now, privet will not have a hollow center. Now, privet is also an invasive, so why is it important to know the difference, um, especially if we were looking at bush honeysuckle, because that's the one that is um, a lot harder to tell the difference of if you are unfamiliar with them. Um, but bush honeysuckle and the vine Japanese honeysuckle, they both have a hollow stem. I don't know if I'm gonna find bush honeysuckle out here, so I'm just gonna point it out with you know the vine. Um, but you wanna know the difference because it may change the way you treat them. Um, and so that's important. If you look closely here, you'll see some berries on this honeysuckle. They're a little dried up, um, but berries, you know, like I was saying with that uh, multiflora rose is how these invasive species really travel far and wide. Songbirds come and eat them because they are a great, you know, fall and winter food source. And then they poop them out and then they spread like wildfire. So, you know, keep in mind that even though they are a food source, it's much better to have native vegetation as a food source than it is to have, you know, honeysuckle. So as you can see, this honeysuckle vine is wrapping up this dogwood and honeysuckle can also get very thick and it can choke out trees. And what it'll also do is if it can get up to the canopy of this tree or on some of the branches, it'll really start to weigh them down and it can cause damage, if not bring these trees down, um, if there's you know big rains and other storms that'll come through and stress out the tree even more. So honeysuckle, it'll also, you know, once these leaves that are brand new leaf out, it's gonna make it even harder for the trees and the other vegetation in here to get sunlight. So even though these honeysuckle vines, they're fairly young, you know, and they're thin, they're going to, if left to their own devices, create a bigger problem as time goes on and as they get bigger. And you can see down here on the forest floor that, um, you know, there's some green down here. Honeysuckle, it'll creep along the ground until it finds something that it wants to climb up. So even if you don't see it at eye level, it's important to look down because it may be crawling along the forest floor. And that's also important because it'll be shading out some of these smaller, shorter species, you know, like your spring ephemeral wildflowers. And it's important to make sure that the native vegetation gets the sunlight that it needs. Otherwise, it's going to struggle. So honeysuckle, we don't like you. There are some native varieties, um, but the Japanese and the bush honeysuckle, y'all gotta go. One of my absolute favorites. But as you can see over here, all these leaves, even though it's a little backlit, that's honeysuckle. And it's climbing to the top of these, you know, smaller trees because it wants sunlight. And it's eventually gonna weigh these branches down and cause damage if not cause damage when it rains and the you know water adds extra weight. So here we have a really nice medley. Um, these invasive species, you often find them on edge areas, especially if you know by roadsides you're cutting back the vegetation but you're not managing what's returning. <gasps> a big bumble, did you see that guys? I really hope I caught that, that was exciting. Um, but if you're not managing the vegetation that returns, you're often going to end up with a lot of invasive species. So the last invasive species I'm going to leave you with on this video, which I will come back to the species um, as the season goes on, is this autumn olive right here. So autumn olive is another invasive species. Autumn olive and multiflora rose were used in Ohio um, to combat erosion, especially after a lot of the mining industries had pulled out. Um, and unfortunately, that was the wrong decision. You know, you could have used native vegetation, but instead they went with autumn olive. And autumn olive is a shrub. I'm gonna shake this guy, can you kinda see? I'm gonna shake him, you can kinda see he's belonging to this whole thing here. And a lot of this is just all autumn olive. 
And so a couple really good tells for autumn olive. If you're looking at it right now and you're not sure um, if this is autumn olive, you want to take a look. It's got speckles. Um, it's got speckles on the buds. It's got speckles on the twigs and kind of like a silvery shine to it. Once it leafs out, those leaves are going to have silvery shine and speckles, especially underneath. The flowers have a silvery shine. Here you can see on the stem, very silvery, shiny, and speckly. Even the fruits will have speckles and a silver shine to them. Um, the fruit is edible. I know some folks like to eat them, but you got to eat a lot. Um, otherwise, you know, because they're really tiny, um, they have big seeds. So even though there are no berries on autumn olive right now, it's another really great example of a species that, you know, spreads far and wide because the songbirds like to eat the berries. So I will continue to update you guys on autumn olive as it leafs out for the season um, and as the flowers pop up so that way you guys can identify it um, as the season carries on. But while I'm standing here, I realized that this multiflora rose down here has some uh, rose hips on it to help you kind of take a look at those guys. You know, they're not very big. Um, if you were to grow roses conventionally in your garden, these are much smaller, even just fell off, um, than the ones that would be on the roses that you grow um, ornamentally in your garden. But these are still useful to wildlife. They like to eat them, um, but they just unfortunately spread multiflora rose everywhere. And while I'm over here, I also see a really great example of another commonly mistaken species for multiflora rose. Let me sneak in here. Word for the wise, do not wear short sandals and a tank top when you are getting into these thorny thickets. So this right here is uh, black raspberries, not blackberries, but black raspberry. You can see that it has this like glaucous white kind of um, covering to the stem. And kind of wipe it off but sometimes multiflora rose has a really red purpley stem which can look really similar to black raspberries which if you like trail snacks you want to promote black raspberries and keep them and they're also useful to wildlife we would rather our songbirds eat black raspberries than rose hips and you know what have you but black raspberries have a round stem just like uh, multiflora rose does but it doesn't have as aggressive um, of thorns let's see that one hurt myself here but you can see them they're not as big they're a little curved but they're not nearly as terrifying and as you can see these leaf buds right here they're not doing anything they're not ready and they won't be ready to leaf out for a lot longer um, and the roses are starting to pop right now so that's another good way to tell the two apart you know I guess you could say that I'm outstanding in my field. I'm trying to get farther away from this house over here because they're playing music and I really don't want YouTube to flag my video for, you know, copyrights because they're blasting music because they're just fantastic people. Um, anyways, so thank you so much for joining me for this video. I am really excited that I was able to get you guys outside. Um, just as a quick recap, we covered Multiflora Rose and some of its look-alikes. We talked extensively about Japanese Honeysuckle, the vine. It's very similar to Bush Honeysuckle, um, so if you're not sure what that looks like it's very similar to the vine it's just in bush form but I will be showing you guys what it looks like as soon as I can find some I just don't think there's any on this property here and then we also took a look at some of the early identifying characteristics of autumn olive I will probably include autumn olive in the next uh, video in the series because there will be a few more identifiable characteristics as it begins to leaf out and even flower so stay tuned um, for some of the other invasive species that aren't quite out yet but I will definitely be making sure to educate you on so that way you guys can be informed gardeners and informed landowners and get this stuff out of here because we don't need it we don't want it you know just because wildlife eat it doesn't mean that it should be here you know there are much better beneficial plants that could be in these growing spaces you know rather than these horrible invasive species so again thank you so much for coming outside with me um, and if you're interested in American woodcocks timber doodles whatever you want to call them uh, stay till the end of the video because here as the sun sets I'm gonna hopefully get some footage of them you know doing their little song and sky dance um, which is really exciting and fun to watch. So again, thank you so much and happy gardening.